She doesn't like couches, especially leather ones. Siesta beyond your welcome and experience the loathsome peeling of exposed skin, akin to the slow rip of a band-aid to reveal an unhealed wound. And yet here she is, stretched full length, legs crossed at the ankles, when a hypnotic voice urges from a cavernous beard, take me back. Slowly from the compartment of her mind, she pulls a memory, unfurls it like a ruby red rug, follows the path to the death of her childhood. It's 4 p.m. when she realizes you're late. The uniformed laughter of the bus stop turns caustic in her ears. Quietly, she slips from the group to the phone box sanctuary, lifts a receiver, connects to conjoins hubs. Dials three little digits for an operator to inform her an ambulance is on its way. As she exits to the low groan of late afternoon traffic, the entire universe suddenly seems to be packed into her school satchel and pulls down on her shoulders. Realizing she is only a mile from her home, she begins to run but knows the battle is over before it's begun as blue flashing wheels come in waves, then halt, envelop her. Looking round, she sees a paramedic motion for her to climb in. Like a field criminal, she is known to them. They arrive at her home to find it locked up, blinds down, breaking in is like waking a sleeping child. Soft screams seep from the shattered window. Entombed in the ambulance, her mother reaches out to hands folded near her navel, as if searching for some umbilical defibrillator she can attach to her chest, restart her petrified heart, as tear swollen lips slur. I didn't want to die today, the daughter's inner child screams, neither did I, but outwardly smiles. It's okay, everything will be okay. But everything wasn't okay. For the next 20 years, mum would be admitted to A and E several times in any given year. She would spend a few short spells in mental health units after overdosing on painkillers, sleeping tablets and or alcohol. Many times I found her believing she was dead. That's a scary thing for a teenager and leaves a lasting impression on an adult. Things began to change in October 2014 when mum lost her memory to delirium through alcohol withdrawal for eight weeks. I've cared for my mum through the worst of her mental health troubles and equally she has cared for me through mine. She once said, if I wasn't ill, you wouldn't be a poet. She's always looking for the glory, that woman. <laughs> I had to admit it seemed true but I hoped that if mum was well, the muse would have found me in a totally different way. I'm a poet and a mental health advocate, and this is a story of my mum and my, my own personal journey through mental illness. Mum and dad's first child, christened Mary, was a healthy full-term baby, stillborn, because she was breached and couldn't be turned. Very ill after the birth, mum was sedated. Her baby girl was buried and a photo was never taken. She never knew what her first child looked like. They were sent home with no counselling and told to get on with their lives. Dad got on with things by becoming a secret drinker until in 2010, liver cirrhosis outed him. I've never seen my dad drunk, and until then, I probably never saw him sober. People often said I was my mum's guardian angel, but if I was hers, then she was surely mine. When I was four, mum took me to the doctors, saying, she's not eating. The doctor told her to go home, not to worry, she'll eat when she's hungry. When you make yourself small, there are fewer details to pick over. At age eight, our hairdresser decided my waist length hair was taking all my nutrients. So they cut it up much like it is today, but when you're eight, you don't really want hair like this. Um, so they cut it up, but I didn't get any fatter. Caught 
in the epicenter of a divorce explosion. I was their shrapnel. At 14, mum took me to the doctor again. I was prescribed antidepressants. We were playing hide and seek round our estate when he grabbed my wrist. Much older than all the other kids, by far, he would know all the good places. So we ran. He took me to the best place. Scream, he said. No one will hear you. Two weeks before my 18th birthday, I tried to take my own life. Mum took me out of my A-levels and my part-time job, saying, life is much more important. When I was 20, I collapsed in a shopping centre. That was the day Mum found out that I was anorexic. She took me home, she put me to bed, and she fed me on ice cream and jelly, soup and bread, chocolate, until I could eat healthily again. Sometimes when things in my life get out of control, I revert back to that technique and I eat things that go down easy. Recovering from anorexia is just that. You're always recovering. Easily I can slip back into not eating when life throws too much at me. And if someone doesn't make food for me, I rarely ever cook a meal for myself. I could count on one hand the amount of meals I've ever made just for me. And I'm 34 years old. It's all about having a healthy mind. When I was very sick, I couldn't see how gravely thin I was, around six and a half stone at my worst. Sometimes now I feel fat, I made stone 10, and a little worry will glance across my chest. But then I look in the mirror, and because my mind is fed and healthy, I can see I'm not fat at all. Then it was my turn to really look after mum. There wasn't any road I wouldn't go down to try and get her to help, get the help she needed. I've become adept at reading the signs, I would frequently find myself on the phone to psychiatrists and mental health charities on Christmas Eve, knowing she was about to overdose and trying in some way to stop it. Still, psychiatrists insisted, your mum's a wee bit lonely and depressed. When you're caring for someone who's only a wee bit lonely and depressed, there's not much support available. So my sister and I we decided to support each other. It's easy for you to leave her. My mind is sifting for sense in your words. Wants to know how you could deal them out when I have been her prime care for over half my life. Instead, I admit, I've cried every day since I left. Yes, you say, but it's easy because you are far away. Static words cried the line, you want to know if I'm still here. I ask about your impending weekend away, if you're looking forward to it. We don't often talk like this. Right now, I don't have much interest. We are two focal points blinded by our own search for the perfect lens. You, my ally, my support network of one, you who have scavenged with me through the devastation after her disordered personality has rioted through our lives again. You who has always helped me. Search for pieces of our mum and from the rubble put together a stone mother. For even a makeshift relic will do. <coughs> this year at the age of 70 years old, my mum finally got a diagnosis of impulsive borderline personality disorder with depression. It turns out every time she tried to kill herself, she never wanted to die. She's now been given a care package, the care we have tried to find for her for years. But the road to this conclusion has not come easy. And I have had to learn to get help unless you push and keep pushing hard. Psychiatrists, doctors, social workers, accident and emergency staff, mental health teams to take some action. When your mum has fallen down a full set of stairs, when she's been admitted to 
after overdosing twice in one week, when she's lost her memory and doctors are trying to make her go home, needing 24-7 care that you cannot provide for her. After mum lost her memory for the first time, we were forced to sell her home. We had to rehome her beloved cat, Kate. She had, she had to move to residential care and later on into fold housing as she was told she was too young and too well to be in residential. Just after she moved into the fold, she took two mini strokes, started to overdose again on painkillers and alcohol. When she lost her memory for the second time, she was admitted to a dementia ward. We thought we'd lost her for good. Finally, the breakthrough came when I decided I would be present at every doctor's meeting, that I would tell them what it was like for myself, my sister and her children to see our mum so unwell and going downhill and yet always seemed to be just, help always seemed to be just outside our grasp because she was just a wee bit lonely and depressed. Supporting someone with mental illness is not always about trying to fix them. It's about helping them to live everyday life to the best of their ability and enjoying the good days. Christmas morning 2008. We were ragged with anticipation, having agreed not to open any gifts after midnight mass. We had wrapped the wee man's presents with dry food so he would open them by himself and not feel left out again. The whole family on speaking terms somehow had all managed a plethora of thoughtful gifts. As you and I sat unwrapping in our pink fluffy dressing gowns, the greatest gift was watching you. Your hair a blonde perfection framing every ooh and ah and oh god that's far too much. You embracing the day that was in it. Soon a deep wafting from the kitchen told us the turkey was almost done. With an apron tied round your waist and drying cloth over your shoulder, you relaxed into the first sitting. Knowing later, family would arrive for food platters followed by mince pies, pudding and brandy sauce. All made by you, head chef, head of our hearts. Someone came up to me recently after I read that and another couple of poems about mental health. And she told me that my advocacy through poetry and my openness on social media changed her life. She told me of her hospitalization earlier in the year and that she had been a cutter from her teens. She wants to change career and work as a mental health nurse and that because of my actions, she got the courage to go swimming again despite the scarring on her legs. If speaking out about mental health can change one person's life, I encourage everyone to speak up and out continuously. At the start of November, I was given an Artist's Career Enhancement Award by the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. It allows me to take time to explore the impact of positive and negative language on mental health. Through a series of creative workshops looking to the service user and the professional health services, culminating in a first collection of poetry. I believe as a poet and having been on the caring and cared for side of mental health, the onus is on me to talk openly about my experiences and to write about them in a way that helps others feel less isolated and, there, and that there is a positive way to live with mental illness. Suffering is a language of the past. I advocate for mental illness because I believe everything can change and life is always worth shouting about. Thank you.